Good morning. This is Morning Voice Keith Keller. Uh, I am a registered nurse working in the field of recovery. I am in long-term recovery myself uh, over 30 years and I uh, am delighted to be here this morning with Michael. Uh, hello uh, to Michael's audience. Very nice to connect with you. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people. People, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense I'm proud to say that I recover loud I never thought I could but I'm so proud that I discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny I needed recovery I still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. I recover loud here to tell my own story I recover proud save a life of like 40 I recover loud yeah I recover loud I recover Welcome to this episode of Recover Loud. I'm your host, Mike Paddleford, and I recover loud. My guest today is Keith Keller, author of the Infinite Recovery Handbook. Uh, Keith, welcome. Uh, it's been great to meet you at this conference uh, this week. And uh, uh, yesterday you were a presenter. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing when you're going out and, and speaking to the public? What, are you, what kind of message are you bringing? When I connect with an audience, I want to tailor my conversation, and it's best to have a conversation rather than just talk at people, certainly, uh, to, I, I take into consideration what, what the audience uh, might be, what they, their ex expectations might be. I, I find myself uh, speaking at the occasional AA meeting, so I want to give an AA appropriate talk. Right. Uh, sometimes I, I, I talk to a, a civic group uh, and want to stay relevant to the concerns of people who are affected indirectly um, by addiction and recovery. So, uh, yeah, try and focus on the needs of a particular Yeah, and, and I mean, one thing we, we learn is we never know what it is we can say that's going to connect with somebody. Very uh, true. We can, we can prepare, we can plan, um, but sometimes it's, it's what we don't think about. It's always that a surprise. That really makes that connection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, on Recover Loud, we like to share, you know, our personal stories of, of um, you know, the struggles and, and how we got to our, our uh, recovery and what that looks like today. Um, you've written uh, the book, The Infinite Recovery Handbook, um, and uh, I got to read, you know, quite a bit of it last night. And, and honestly, as I was mentioning, you know, I had to skip through, so I got a better idea of the, of the whole book, but I'm... I'm it grabbed me, and I can't wait to get back to some of the sections. Well, thank you, thank you, know. you for that. Uh, it's uh, kind of challenging to write uh, a book for. Uh, I want to reach a broad audience, so Correct. certainly uh, people in recovery, and you know. So I don't want to make it too uh, uh, highfalutin, and, right. and but there's a lot of information that people benefit from. So that that's the challenge, and I also know that people like like the academics here at the conference are also going to be looking at it. So, you know, it, it, it keeps me on my toes, certainly. I have been, so I would go out and identify myself uh, as, depending where I am, uh, I'm in long-term recovery from alcohol use disorder and polysubstance use disorder. Um, if I'm at a 12-step meeting, hi, I'm Keith, I'm an alcoholic. Just yes. real simple, old school, but the language now, you know, um, there, there's kind of a, a couple of different approaches people want to take, and the, and the people that are not directly affected are very concerned about how exactly. they, they uh, you know, and, and we do know that words are, are very powerful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we want to just sort of keep everybody comfortable yeah, uh, exactly. when we can. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, I got sober in... Alcoholics Anonymous, 12-step. I call that the traditional model because exactly. it's, it's been there. And, and they observe traditions, uh, which are, are important. Maybe something we'll, we'll touch on further down in the conversation. So I was just oddly fascinated with alcohol and the consumption of alcohol. Yeah. And there was definitely something unusual uh, and abnormal about so, my drinking from a very early Age. Yeah. Dad, give me some beer. Right, and, and at what age did you start first asking for that sip of beer? 
Oh, five, yeah. four, five, like yeah. Just, and was it uh, normal in your household for for them to be drinking alcohol and for them to allow you? Well, to as I, as I got a little older, so my, my father was born in Europe, and uh, you know, so so uh, my parents divorced, and on you know it'd be Sunday evening dinner at my dad's. Uh, there, there'd be a glass of wine, and pretty soon, can I have another one? And that's that's kind of how it how it went, and that was the sort of part of the iceberg that that showed because pretty quickly I started, you know, I guess at around age thirteen, I caught the perfect buzz, and I spent about the next two decades trying to recreate that, and of course, it never quite works out the same. Yeah. Um, so I grew I grew up, uh, got interested in music. And my, my alcohol and, and recreational drug consumption and use certainly became, you know, part of that all. And, and, and what was that doing for you? I mean, because people can go out and play music and, and do these things without using, but what was it you were gaining from? Oh, uh, I guess it was the search for the ultimate note. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I got interested in drums. I'll blame that on Ringo uh, <laughs> going back to, uh, you know, a long time ago. Uh, but... Um, it just looked like a lot of fun, uh, so I, t I, I took some lessons and got kind of good at an early age. And on a, you know, at, at the tender age of 15, on a school night, I might be out playing in bars, wow. getting paid in drinks. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. This and is, where was this what I want to do? Uh, down on uh, the area of Massachusetts, north of Boston. Okay. Um, there was quite a, you know, a, a happening music scene between there, you know, and down to Boston. Uh, some of the more famous bands, uh, like like the band Boston, and yeah. uh, and others came out of that whole uh, fertile uh, musical area. So I, you know, I was sort of, you know, down in the trenches right. um, in that, but certainly aspiring to to do yeah. that. Um, you know, you don't see, um, you know, those opportunities pop up for a lot of people. Uh, so you must have been uh, doing well at, at playing the drums. The band must have been getting some. Well, yeah, I mean, but you know, through throughout high school, I, yeah. I found myself in bands because uh, I was, I guess, somewhat competent. I'll go with that. <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, so with older musicians, of course, uh, who uh, you know could buy alcohol, had had uh, other things to sample, and and so uh, you know, I was in fast company from an early age. Um, yeah. I somehow got into the Berkeley College of Music, which is wow. kind of a yeah no that that was a, a, an amazing opportunity that I squandered uh, along with many others. In, so uh, in music. You, you started to attend. How long did you stay there? Stayed there a year and then uh, ran out of money. wasn't you know getting a lot of support uh, for my aspirations in in music, and uh, I went on the road uh, with a guy I've since made amends to. Um, he, yeah, he, he, he's actually uh, kind of popular again. Uh, his music is on the Amazon commercial with the elderly couple dancing. Uh, I wow. only have eyes for you. Yeah, Terry Johnson had a traveling See. band, so I got to yeah. go out and sample that. And, and that was another opportunity that I... You know, drank myself self out of. I, I doubt if he'll see this, but Terry, I I, I meant the amends. If you're if you see this, well, I, I hope he does. Um, you know, this show is growing and, and reaching more and more uh, across the country. Uh, yeah, you're doing something wonderful here. I mean, yeah. I'm really thank you. Yeah, we, the opportunity. Uh, just uh, real quick, welcome uh, those of you in, uh, just outside St. Louis, Missouri, who are now watching this show. Oh, cool. um, you know, and. You know, it's, it's stories like yours and, and people's and, and other people um, who really give the show the value. Uh, so I appreciate you coming. A um, uh, little known fact, uh, Berkeley School of Music was one of my aspirations. I was a trumpet player in high school. Very nice. um, did pretty well. Um, and we had done a, a jazz uh, band competition. Uh, I believe it was my sophomore year in high school. And when I got there and I, I saw the musicians and the things that they were doing, I was just amazed. And, and I said, this is, this is my path. And I never made it. You know, um, yeah, it's, it's a big competitive world. And yeah. I, I, I was you know, sort of in, in my high school and community, I was kind of the big fish. And then you get to Berkeley and you're <laughs> mediocre, if not below yeah. that. Um, exactly. It is a world-class stage. And, yeah. um, I'm glad glad they're training the you know the best musicians because yeah. now I just enjoy music. I, I stopped playing the drums about ten twelve years ago. Just, so you don't play at all. I, I, they're they're all packed up downstairs. Yeah. I can't say never, but uh, I think writing kind of supplanted that became my creative outlet. 
Um, so you started writing your book um, in what year? Uh, this is my second book. Yes. And uh, so I started this one in 2017. Uh, I was actually pitching uh, to a publisher. I wanted to do sort of a rewrite on my first one, uh, which came out in 2014. And what was the name of the first book? first one was called Sustainable Recovery. So I've kind of been, moved, you know, yeah. uh, rebranding and, and uh, yeah, re, re, retooling a little bit, but also kind of, also uh, very much moving forward and progressing in my, my ideas about recovery as well. Yeah, and, and we talked a little bit about that uh, before we started, how, you know, it, it's a journey, okay? Uh, my definition uh, of recovery is the journey through the process of change that's going to create a better tomorrow. Um, Very nice. It has nothing to do, my, my definition has nothing to do with substances. Um, if quitting a substance is the goal of your journey, you know, great, um, but that doesn't have to be the end result of recovery. And when we get there, it's not over. You know, we're constantly evolving, uh, personally, spiritually, uh, professionally even, um, you know, taking us in directions we never imagined we'd go. Um, so when you started writing the books, uh, what, what was your goal? What was the message you were trying to put out there? Ah, wow. Okay, so the, with, with the first one, I was following a very basic uh, self-help book formula, which is sort of my story, uh, then uh, my ideas about recovery, and then part three would be how my ideas can benefit other people. So I was one who, you know, now 30 years ago when I entered recovery, the traditional model, AA and the 12 steps, were pretty much the only show in town. Yeah. And uh, I jumped in with, you know, both feet, as they say, did the work. That's, you know, that that's something I would suggest to anybody, do the work. But, you know, as a registered nurse, um, you know, I, you ask any registered nurse about that and they'll say, well, we want to work smart. It's not that we're afraid of hard work, but let's, let's work smart. Let's do this right. Let's do this, you know, the most efficient efficient, organized way. And this was, you know, sort of my ideas about recovery. And also, very early on, um, you know, having worked in numerous areas of nursing, but especially in substance use disorder rehab and detoxing, um, saw that there was a real need for more uh, ideas and, and to encompass all forms of addiction, all pathways to recovery, you know, before that became what everybody wants, you know, more or less, I think in the last five years, that's come a long way. But I was yeah. 10 years ago, kind of, you know, move, very much moving in, in this direction. So uh, I have done some other things aside from nursing. I've studied alternative and energy healing modalities. And then 10 years ago, got into a kind of a very structured personal development, science-based uh, meditation is very central to this. And it is sort of a, a, a way to hmm, imagine the possibilities uh, and, and create uh, what, you know, how, what, do, what do I want to do in recovery? Well, I want to step into my best potential. Uh, I want to, you know, and, and I literally went from a guy who had always thought maybe someday I'll write a book to a guy who writes books. Um, which, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a leap and you just have to kind of create in your mind the, the, the feeling of, of how that's going to be right. and the details, the what's going to happen, the when's it going to come along, who's going to facilitate or help me with that or what's, you know, that stuff happens. You set the goal and you start moving toward it. Yeah. And, and a lot of times we stop when we have all those questions because we don't have those answers. Afraid to move forward. Yeah. So, all right, so, so very simply, I think um, that we are in one of two states, uh, which is the kind of, we're, we're at 
basic survival level, or we are in kind of a, a creative creation state. Um, obviously, if I'm struggling with an addiction, um, I'm pretty close to survival level. I'm really just trying to make it through the day, feed my addiction, and maybe I am, you know, my particular version of that was I was stuck in a repeating cycle of uh, struggle through the day, um, uh, attain or obtain, uh, you know, whatever, use my substance of choice, uh, modify my state to the point of oblivion, check out and repeat right over and over uh and and is that life and and does that keep working no obviously you know and there's a lot a lot of details in how you know i develop tolerance become dependent on you know that substance and it stops working uh long before we realize it does so i am at this very baseline place where I'm just struggling to survive. Now, creation, of course, is as we sort of enter recovery, get our feet underneath us, uh, and start to learn how to, you know, all the things maybe that we didn't learn right. earlier in life, um, repairing the, the damage, right. the baggage, clearing up the wreckage, uh, and, and we start to move forward and think about what is possible? What do I want to do? What's yeah. What you know? What what does it mean to be in recovery to overcome this thing yeah. thing of addiction? So learning, um, building things uh, uh, in your life, um, doing podcasts and, and TV shows, um, writing books. These are all the possibilities yeah. that all and, of us are capable of. And see, you know, back when I was using, uh, I I used to call myself a functioning addict. I was trying to raise my three kids. Um, I did in the beginning still have dreams and goals. I didn't know how to attain them, but I was trying. You know, I would get a job and lose it in a month. Um, you know, I would start doing well and it would blow up, you know. Um, so nothing was sustainable then. You know, I, I had the drive, I had the ambition. Um, you know, one of the reasons I've, I started, you know, my addiction got really bad was in the beginning, uh, I was getting this medication and I was selling it. And I was the, my first addiction was money and power. I was able to provide my kids with the stuff that they wanted and the stuff that I didn't have growing up, you know. Um, we had family members that lived, you know, just outside of Boston, Peabody, Lynn, um, sure. and I grew up in Webster, Mass. Um, and my aunts and uncles lived at the lake, you know, we lived in an apartment building, um, and I always wanted to be like the other side, you okay. know. So now, now once I got to be an adult and my kids, at, at first, you know, uh, scraping by, I became a store manager and I was doing well and then I got hurt. So the idea of being on disability the rest of my life, having a fixed income, losing out on all of those opportunities, you know, that I wanted to give my kids, um, I found that I could still do that if I was breaking the law and selling my medication. Um, well, we do what we have to do yeah, and, and this, know, is, this is the survival exactly. level motivation. Yeah, and sure. you know, it was, it, it really drove me and I, and I thought I was doing well by them. Later on, of course, once the, um, you know, I, I started doing a little bit, it got more and more, I could sell less, I wasn't making the money, I started spending money, I had to find ways to get it, I started selling everything I owned, Lo yeah. lost it all. And less sustainable, obviously. Yeah, you know, and then today when I, when I asked the kids about that, that whale watching trip that we took, we got all the great pictures, um, they know that I sold drugs to do. Um, that the uh, the time we went to the theme park, they know that every time I went to the bathroom, I was in there getting high. Um, so all those memories, even though I was doing it for the right reasons, I thought it turned out to be um, you know uh, traumatizing and and detrimental to their growth now because everything they saw as good is tainted. Um, so today, you know, being present and being able to do these things with my kids, all my kids are adults now, um, but I'm able to be there for them. You know, uh, my son. Um, you know, he's, he's a Marine in North Carolina, uh, he's, he's married, doing well, he just went back to Japan uh, for another five months, um, but he calls me, and he calls me dad, and he, he tells me what he's going through, and you know, I get to be there for him. Well, your so, insight into that um, is, is certainly uh, validating of the work you've done in, in recovery, and that, that is, you know, a, a higher level of recovery to come to understand that even though superficially that those experiences 
seemed okay. Now you right. you, you know the, the the true substance of what was was going on, exactly. the impact it had on others, yeah. uh, and obviously you've you've gotten right with that. That's yeah. that's as good as it gets. Yeah, Michael. and you know those are those gifts of recovery that we're all working towards. Um, and for people who who haven't gotten that yet, people who are still fighting DHHS for custody of their children, things like that. Um, sometimes that pile seems insurmountable. But I, I promise them all the time, if you keep doing the work on yourself, it doesn't matter, that pile's gonna get smaller without you even picking things well, off. Well, it, it, it is a process, and we get yeah. so stuck in that survival mode where we're thinking about the, the, the things, and we're just really focused on uh, what's going on in the environment, what issues, right. uh, when can I resolve them, that, that kind of thing. Um, and if we can just kind of move a little bit out of that and start, you know, functioning from the level of observing our reality the way somebody else would, then we can start to, you know, make our best decisions, call in the resources, and open ourselves up to the possibility that uh, it's going to work out because yeah. because it, it always does. But but it's fear, yeah. uh, it's. Um, concern about you know the things that we're lacking um, worrying about the judgment of others uh, we get locked down in these things and just well and, and collapse it's, it's into all based on our past experience you know we know that the person we were could try this and it would end in failure we don't know the person we are today has the potential to do it better. Well, we yeah but but we always did but, and, right. and, and that's the thing and it's, it's how, how how can we connect yeah. To that possibility, so there's a couple of things that that I suggest to people, and I, you know, I've uh, learned a lot of lessons from my work in the traditional model of, of, of recovery, and I, I realize that while I might not need to go to a meeting every day, um, I, I do need a community of like-minded people uh, with the same goals and objectives who will support me unconditionally, and you know, there are many forms of community. Um, being at a conference is a form of community. Our online uh, our our uh, social media type mm -hmm. stuff, that, that's also a form of community. Um, mentoring or sponsorship, certainly. I've had the same friend for over 30 years. Wow. Um, I've known him for that long, he's been my official... Did you know him prior to? No, um, no. met him in so, early recovery. So, um, if you don't mind talking about that for a minute, um, right now, I am the living house manager for um, a, a program where I have three guys living there, early recovery. They're all trying to get through and, uh, you know, turn their lives around. And um, as of right now, all three of them are just about at the 30-day mark. Uh, one of them is at 45 days sober. Um, and one of the things they're, they're looking to do is to find a mentor, either a sponsor or a recovery coach. Um, and, you know, at that stage of, of their of their growth, they don't really know who to ask, how to go about finding somebody. Uh, That's a challenge. Can you suggest, uh, you know, something that they could do to, to choose the right sponsor? Well, obviously, bear in mind that uh, the right person is not going to come knock on their door. They're going to have to go out and yeah. sample what's out there. So obviously meetings are, are a good place to, to do that or other types of organizations uh, where they can observe people. Um, online it's not, yeah, it's a little bit different. It's not quite as real. When you get a sense of how somebody speaks, carries themselves, yeah. and the content of what they they talk about, their values, their experiences, that's, you know, and, and it's, you know, the, the first sponsor that I had was not the sponsor that I was going to move forward in life with, but he was, you know, fine for the first couple of years. Yeah. So there are people who are dedicated to this work, uh, certainly a lot more than I am, uh, and very good at it, um, but perhaps not, not exactly the guy who's like, yeah, I'll be everybody's temporary sponsor, right. and maybe not so much. But, yeah, um, I, I, I would suggest to people that they kind of get out and see see who's out there who and who when, when, when you hear people speak like you you said you know finding like-minded people doing the same thing with the same kind of goals um you know i i was lucky enough my very first sponsor um was you know was business-minded very much like-minded he, he works in recovery he's trying to help people and i knew from the moment you know i first heard him that this is the guy i i want to to uh you know, to help guide. Well, that's, you know, that we, we have a little brain in the middle of our stomach yeah. that 
knows these things. And, and if we can listen to it, then, then yeah, we, we can make good decisions usually. Um, accountability. Uh, and a willingness to make yourself accountable to someone and, and follow guidance, which isn't always comfortable. Right. Honesty uh, is certainly Im important in that relationship, and that's what it is. It, it, it's a relationship. Um, then learning about recovery, learning about addiction. Um, the traditional model knows a lot. There's a lot of wisdom in the big book, the other literature of, of AA, and then there's unlimited stuff available to us now through the, through the internet and, and many fine uh, independent authors, um, you know, and, and finding the things that, that resonate with you. Uh, we certainly benefit from having a belief system, whether that's a belief in a power greater than than myself, a uh, religious god, or uh, creative intelligence of the universe, which is kind of my go-to. There, there is, you know, there is something going on. Um, there is like literally, uh, you know, gallons of blood pumping through miles of blood vessels in my body. My heart will beat three trillion times in my life. Thousands of chemical reactions go on every second in my body. I'm not doing that something is and you know it's, it's sometimes it's hard for people to warm up to the concept of of that but there are many many different versions of that people just have to kind of find their own place with that service that's the other piece you know you're doing it right now um we're here at, at a conference and, to and 30, you were, talk 30 about years that. in you're still doing it yourself you know um so uh we talked a little bit about you know what what you when you're presenting and, and speaking to the public. Um, what are some of the other things you're doing uh, today to connect with people? Um, you have an online presence as well. I, I, I do. Uh, well, I, I uh, you know I pay the bills as a registered nurse uh, working in the field of addiction. Uh, in the last couple of years, I have worked uh, in a medical office where we had we have a uh, there was I no longer there. There is a. A uh, great program where they do medications for addiction treatment, mm -hmm. uh, and that is a whole piece of you know what's going on out there right now. There is a lot of um, dedication in in the healthcare system. Um, there's still you know still a lot of glitches, a lot of a lot of stigma, just the way there is in you know the wider culture. Um, but you know there are a lot of people very dedicated to. Uh, helping people with substance use disorders, and um, I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of people like we're, we're seeing here at the conference, yeah. um, you know, who just spend their time looking at brain scans or compiling statistics, and somebody has to do this. I'm glad that there, there are people who are dedicated to that. Um, so working in, you know, in the mental health field, uh, also in the last year, community mental health, and shortly I'll be going to work in an inpatient detox. So helping people directly. Um, I and have a. Is that here in New Hampshire? Uh, that is just over the line down in oh, Massachusetts where I reside. It's actually right in my own community, so I'm kind of excited about that opportunity. Um, I'm usually uh, active when, when the opportunity presents in a, a various local organizations. Uh, I expect to be speaking right at the town library sometime in the next month or two. Uh, I am, uh, as you said, uh, the online presence. I have a free online support community and uh, I, I don't know if you're going to link things up, yes, but, but yep. that's uh, you can find that through my website, uh, infiniterecovery.org. Um, so on Facebook, we have a thousand people with all different forms of addiction, many pathways to recovery uh, from about 12 countries uh, who, uh, and this is a little unique for Facebook and didn't happen randomly, okay, they're very respectful, supportive of one another, engaged yeah. very, very nicely. I think you, you popped in a couple of times have, yes. and thank you for, for your posts and Absolutely. contributions to that. Um, I have some real rock stars who are like the content machines. It's, it's, yeah. it's become easy. but. Uh, there's there's uh, hundreds of people uh, active every month. I look at the statistics, so yeah. so I know that, that we are you know helping and supporting. Where can people find your book? Uh, it's available on Amazon and select bookstores, at least here in, in the Northeast. Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life and recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing.